when we say food, uh, we are talking about the material with which we build our… we build this body. Right now, uh, physically, what we consider as ourselves is essentially a heap of food that we've eaten. So how can we not pay attention to this because it is the building material with which we are building this body and when we build something, we must know towards what purpose we are building it. If you want to build this building, however wonderful the design is, still the material that goes into it makes the difference. So the design may be great, but what kind of material we actually structure this body with makes a whole world of difference. Right now, largely in every culture, people are eating the way they are eating because our fathers and mothers ate that way, our grandfathers and grandmothers ate that way and it goes back. We need to understand when they ate that way, they did not have options. It was… food was about survival. They ate what was locally available. And what they ate on that day became the next day's culture. <laughs> but today we have come to a place where uh, wherever you are in the world, you're in Doha but you're eating fruit and fresh vegetable, <laughs> which I'm sure hundred years ago nobody ever tasted. <laughs> so now we have choices. It is time to consider what is it that should go into our system. First of all, what is objective? In the yogic culture, we have this, if you want to be a menial laborer, you want to work ten, twelve hours a day physically, you must eat one way. You want to be an athlete, you want to eat another way. You want to be a warrior, you must eat another way. You want to use your brain, you must eat another way. You want to be loving and nice, you must eat another way. Like this for different objectives, we eat differently. So bringing a little bit of awareness about this, whatever I say now is not hard and fast do's and don'ts. This is about conducting our life more consciously. Every aspect of our life, whatever we do, if we simply move our hand like this unconsciously, it moves one way. If you move this consciously, it moves another way. If you simply throw words out, it happens one way. If you throw these words out consciously, it happens another way. Sim similarly, if you simply throw food, it happens one way. If you consciously take it in, it happens another way. So the idea is to bring awareness and consciousness to every aspect of life, including the food, which is an important part. Food may not be, for many people, a deciding factor because their life may not be so precise in requirement, but uh, definitely plays a significant role. For example, uh, you know, taking myself as an example, the level of activity that uh, happens in our day-to-day -day life, we are seven days of the week, 365 days working, twenty hours a day at least. <laughs> For almost twenty-five years, I managed with only two and a half hours of average sleep per night. Now I'm getting little lazy and I'm stretching it to four hours or sometimes a little more. The choice is this, do you want to live? Have we come here to live an experienced life or have… are we here to somehow avoid life and die one day? If you're sleeping eight to ten hours a day in twenty-four hours, that means you're effectively sleeping away forty-five to fifty percent of your life. <laughs> so whether instead of living for… if you live for hundred years, you're actually awake only for fifty years of your life, which is uh, a sheer waste of life. So this must be very clear, are we here to experience and know the vibrance of life in its fullest depth and dimension or are we here to somehow pass it and be done with it? So only if you are concerned about making life happen at its highest possible level, 
then what you consume becomes an important part of this. There are many ways to look at this in this brief amount of time that we have. It could lead to confusions if I go into very sophisticated way of looking at things to come down to something very simple. If you look at any machine, when I say a machine, we have seen, all of you are uh, deeply engrossed in your cell phones I am seeing, uh, whether you take a cell phone as a simple machine, it's not simple for you <laughs> or you take a car or a computer, whatever, all of it needs some kind of energy to perform. Let's take a car as an example. Suppose you take a petrol-driven car and put diesel into it, it may still manage a little bit, but it will not function at its optimum. In this way, if you look at it, this machine, the human mechanism is the gadget on the planet. It is the highest and the most sophisticated machine on the planet that we have known. Any number of machines are there, but nothing comparable to this one. This is the most sophisticated machine. We are still not able to figure out a single molecule of DNA as to how it functions. <laughs> With all our brain, we still can't figure it. That's how complex and sophisticated it is. When you have such a machine, how you conduct it becomes very, very important. It is so subtle, the very way you sit and stand affects the way it functions. Shall we do a little experiment with you? Hello? Shall we do a little experiment with you? If you're willing to sit up with your spine erect, you keep all the five fingers, five fingers together, that means you must keep your cell phone down. <laughs> if you keep your five fingers together and place it upon your thigh, Gently placed, do not press, gently placed. What we will do is don't do it right now, look at me. Holding it upon your thigh like this, with your eyes closed, breathe slightly deeper than normal. What… You, how you normally breathe slightly deeper than normal and notice how the air fills up into your lung. Or in other words, where is the maximum expansion and contraction? Observe this. As you're doing this, I will say switch with your eyes without breaking the rhythm of your breathing, just turn it over and again when I say switch, get back. In these two positions, something very fundamental about your breath will change. I want you to notice what is the change and you must be able to tell me. You will be able to notice this only if your spine is erect, your eyes closed and your mind is focused on your breath. Shall we do this? Please close your eyes, all the five fingers together gently placed upon your thigh, slightly deeper than normal, just inhale and exhale, noticing how the air fills up into your lungs, with your eyes closed. Switch, turn your hands over. Switch again. Please open your eyes. Do you notice some change between the two? Hmm? Can you tell me what's the change? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what is happening and what she said is, when you hold the palm facing down, you will feel the expansion more in your diaphragm region. When you do this, suddenly it moves a little higher up in the chest. Why this is happening is, among the three lobes in the lung, if you keep your hand facing down, the maximum expansion and contraction happens in the lower lobe of the lung. If you just turn it around, it moves to the middle lobe of the lung. This is just by turning your hand over, the very way you breathe is altering itself. It's not just the breath, the very way the life and its function in the body are altering themselves simply because you turn your hand over. How many times in a day, unconsciously, do you do this? <laughs> now you're setting yourself into a turmoil and hoping to be peaceful, life does not work like that on this planet. This is like you sit in your car, you don't know what these three pedals are, kick any one of them whenever you feel like it, and you know what a jerky driver you will be. 
Right now, please see this, this is what is happening. It is not that you do not know peace in your life. It is not that you do not know joy or ecstasy in your life. It is not that you do not know love in your life. You know all these things, but none of them are steadily there, it's jerky. Because the driver is jerky, because the driver knows nothing about the machine. You have been gifted with the most sophisticated mechanism in the universe that we know and you are handling it like it's a crude thing. So once you have a machine like this, it's important what kind of fuel is going into the system. When we say what kind of fuel, what kind of fuel is this machine designed for? As I said, there are many, many ways of looking at it. The simplest way is elementary canal from the mouth to the anal outlet. Digestive process happens on many different levels. Now what kind of food is this digestive system designed for? <clears throat> if you look at the animal kingdom, largely in the world, there are carnivores and herbivores, uh, animals which eat vegetable ma material and those which eat meat. Between these two, carnivores and herbivores, there is a significant difference in the way their bodies are constructed and particularly their elementary canal, which is the digestive process. One basic thing is to start with, <clears throat> if you look at all the herbivorous animals, they have incisors in the front, cutting teeth and molars at the back which are grinding teeth. All the carnivorous animals have incisors, not so well developed molars and they have two extra pairs of canine, that is if you want to eat meat in nature, to tear the meat and eat you need this extra pair of teeth. Somehow please check, you don't have them. And if you check the jaw moment of herbivores and carnivores, all the carnivores have only cutting action in their jaw moment. They have to just cut their small pieces and eat it. All the herbivorous animals have cutting and grinding action because you are supposed to grind your food. Why this design difference is, if you ever put a little bit of rice in your mouth and leave it there for a minute and close your eyes and observe, you will notice the rice will turn sweet, raw rice will turn sweet in your mouth because the carbohydrates are being converted into sugar right here in your mouth region because there is a certain enzyme called thallin in your saliva which every herbivorous animal has, which starts the digestive process in the mouth region itself. None of the carnivorous animals have this, so they only cut and eat, swallow their food. Herbivores are supposed to chew their food and eat. If you go a little further, the length of the elementary canal, if you look at it, in all the carnivorous animals, it's only three times the length in all the carnivorous, in the, all the herbivorous animals, the length of the elementary canal is approximately five to six times the length of your body. Do you know what is the length of this pipe running through your body? No, there are doctors. Hmm? I'm sorry? It is anywhere between twenty-four to thirty feet, which is approximately five to six times the length of your body. So in this kind of elementary canal, if you put the duration of time that a particular food item takes to pass through, if you put raw meat to the system, it will take anywhere between seventy to seventy-two hours to pass through the system. If you cook… if you put cooked meat into the system, it will take forty-eight to fifty-two hours to pass through the system. If you put cooked vegetarian meals, it will take twenty-four to thirty hours to pass through the system. If you put an uncooked vegetable, it will take twelve to fifteen hours to pass through the system. If you put a fruit, it will take a half to three hours to pass through the system. If you keep raw meat outside in summer, for seventy-two hours what happens? Similar things happen in your body or in other words, enormous amount of rotting process happens and excessive bacterial activity is taking, uh, taking place within the body. Keeping these bacterial levels lower, in the body becomes the biggest function that the body is functioning and doing right now, which makes one… I see that with regular uh, lunch, dinner, these everywhere, either coffee or worse, coke is being served, because without that most people will fall asleep on the table. 
because that is the nature of food that we are consuming. The level of inertia that this food is creating is such. Now all the doctors, particularly in the West, are saying minimum eight hours you must sleep. <laughs> sleep is not a requirement in the body. Restfulness is a requirement in the body. When I say restfulness, right now I am standing, walking and speaking, but if you check my pulse on an empty stomach, you will see my pulse will be somewhere between thirty-six to forty-four. Right now, it may be in the range of around fifty. If body is going at an easier pace, the amount of rest that it demands in terms of shutting down will come down considerably. It's like you have a car which needs fifteen days in a month, it needs to be serviced. You could as well walk, <laughs> ride a bicycle, you know. If it needs one day in a month service, all right. If it needs fifteen days servicing, servicing in one month's time, it's not worth having. That is how one will begin to feel about their own body. When it needs too much servicing, you wonder why the hell you're here. That thought will very easily come when you… when the body pulls you down, people will wonder, why am I here? What am I doing? These questions will come. Business women who have uh, big plans in their life, the most important thing is have a vibrant and alert body which is willing to do what you want, which is willing to stay awake, which is willing to wake up when you want. It doesn't fall asleep in the middle of something. <laughs> It's very, very important to have an alert and agile body. Now, nourishment problems are there. So, living in a desert, if I just depend on vegetables, after all everything has to come from somewhere, I may not have enough nourishment, that problem is there. So, if nourishment is a problem, if we have to eat some kind of non-vegetarian, the best way to eat it is what is furthest away from us, in the evolutionary scale, we must eat that. The closer they are to us, the more information to process. When I say more information to process, right now you understand, you need to understand this that your body is forming itself, the way it is forming itself, only because of a certain level of memory and information that it carries. When I say memory and information, people think memory and information is in their mind. No, what your mind carries is a minuscule. A body carries a trillion times more memory than you can imagine. For example, Michelle, do you remember your great-great-great-great-grandmother, how she looked? No. You don't remember how your great-great-great-great-grandmother looked, but her nose is sitting on your face right now because your body remembers. Your body remembers how your forefathers were a million years ago, it is not forgotten. You might have forgotten, but your body remembers. There's a phenomenal amount of memory in every cell in this body. And similarly, the more evolved a particular creature is, the more complex it has become, the more difficult it is for the system to absorb and make it a part of itself. So suppose uh, you eat an animal which has emotions, the moment you consume an animal with emotions, the complexity of information in that animal is such that it will not integrate easily into our system. If you eat an animal which does not have so much thought and emotion, its ability to retain its own structure is very minimal and it integrates itself into our body as a part of ourselves very easily. So when we consume something, this is the fundamental criteria that we want to eat something which is a simple life. Without consuming some life, you cannot exist here. Whether it's a plant, vegetable, fruit, animal, everything is life. Now the idea is to consume a simpler life which has less capability of thought and emotion. The more capability it has, your ability to integrate that will become less or in other words, the nature of that animal will start manifesting within ourselves in some ways. It is not that if you eat a camel, you will become a camel tomorrow morning. But over a period of time, a little camelistic trends can come. So, unless when somebody is extraordinarily physically active, 
they are able to manage this to some extent. As physical activity comes down, how consciously you eat makes a world of difference. A human being need not be serviced for eight hours a day, if only if he or she eats properly the kind of food substance which easily integrates into the system, the kind of food substance that will not create inertia but it will create dynamism, the kind of food substance which will not need to stay in the body for long periods of time, something that passes through the system quickly. Carnivorous animals have a short elementary canal because meat passes through the system slowly. Herbivores have a long elementary canal because vegetable matter passes through the system very quickly. And we have a long elementary canal and the purpose of a long elementary canal is a more complex process is possible. When a more complex process is possible, what it means is the quality and the nature of the food in some way impacts us in character, in the way we are, in the way we think, emote and behave within ourselves and around us. So how consciously we consume food and how conscious we are as to how food behaves within us. If you are conscious enough, if something appears in front of you, you will simply know whether to eat it or not eat it. If that kind of awareness is not there, one has to have function by information as to different foods, how they behave and they do not behave. I was speaking to a medical group in, uh, in United States and uh, I told them, the way America is eating right now, if you change the way you're eating, you can bring down sixty percent of the incidence of cancer in this country, simply if you change the way you're eating because you're eating food which is one… on an average about forty-five days old. In the yogic culture, if anything is cooked, within one and a half hours you must consume it, from the stow straight to the plate, <laughs> always. I'm sure in this culture also it was like that till recently. So, as you keep the food and it starts uh, deteriorating. If you eat deteriorating food and then you're wondering why your own body cells are working against you, that cannot be helped. We are spending billions of dollars in research for the ailments that we have created. We need to understand this. Every human cell, every cell in this body is essentially programmed for health. But right now, seventy percent of the ailments on the planet or chronic or in other words, they're self-created. There are infectious diseases which are an invasion from another organism. That has to be dealt with medicine. All the chronic ailments, whatever it is, is manufactured from within. Why would our own body manufacture ailment for us? Simply because without understanding the fundamentals of how it functions and one important part of it is what we consume and how we consume. If we change this one aspect as to what we're consuming and how we consume it, health could be a natural process for most people. I would say sixty to seventy percent of the population will never get into health if only there's a little more conscious way of eating on this planet. If you have questions, please. Um, hello, thank you for a very inspirational speech. Um, I have two problems, chocolate and cigarettes. <laughs> and I know I need to stop them, but uh, what is your advice for me to have more self-control? Thank oh, you. A cigarette is not a foodstuff, so I will leave it alone. <laughs> About chocolates, <laughs> it happened one day on the Florida beach. A man was uh, <clears throat> walking and he found a lamp, a kind of a lantern which was sticking out of the sand. He took it out and just to check what it is, took his shirt and just wiped it 
and lo, a genie arrived. You heard the story before. So the genie said, uh, three gifts, whatever you want, three boons I will give you, what do you want? He said, wow, I want a red Ferrari. Right there on the beach, a red Ferrari arrived. Then he said, wow, this is for real, I want million bucks, one million dollars in the back seat. Then he said, what is the third one? He thought about it and said, I want to be irresistible to women. He turned into a box of chocolates. <laughs> so, when it's something so precious in a woman's conference, I won't go chocolate. <laughs> chocolate is a very positive thing. The problem with chocolate is you're eating with sugar, okay? If you just eat chocolate, it's a very wonderful thing to eat. But you're mixing with such enormous amount of sugar, which will definitely cause damage to the system. If you can eat it without the sugar, that will be great. And similarly for the cigarette, without the tobacco, if you smoke it, it would be great <laughs> I'm sorry? That's why I said chocolate is great, it's the sugar which is the problem. <laughs> That's up to you <laughs> See, we have gotten used to con like a cigarette or coffee or whatever, these are nervous stimulants. If you consume a nervous stimulant, it'll pep you up for a certain amount of time and then dump you. So you consume, uh, let's say next two years you consume coffee every day in the morning. One day if there is no coffee, you will freak, you will get headache, you will get all kinds of problems because you are used to the nervous stimulant now. If you use any kind of stimulant or intoxicant upon your nervous system, your ability to perceive will go down. When I say your ability to perceive, See, if I stand here with my eyes closed, if somebody enters this hall, with my eyes closed, I will tell you what kind of person has entered this hall. Oh, is this some yoga? No, even your dog can do it, isn't it? Yes or no? Your dog is sitting under the sofa, somebody at the door, he knows who has come. Yes or no? Does he know or not? He knows. Now, when a dog can know, why is it that you cannot know? simply because we have dulled our nervous system in so many different ways. First of all, living in urban centers, our nervous system is dulled by excessive input, the type of food that we eat, stimulants, intoxicants, all these things. If you dull your nervous system, the statement that you're making to life is, I want to dodge life, I want to avoid life, I don't want to experience life. So if that is the thing, if we cut a nerve in your spine, you will not experience anything. Shall we do that? You're trying to do it slowly, I'm talking about doing it more efficiently. Is that what you want to do to yourself? Because only if your nervous system is at its highest level of relaxation and alertness, only then you will know life in its entirety. Otherwise, Simply what somebody has told you and taught you, that's all you will know. You will not perceive life the way it is. So, whether you're consuming coffee, cigarette, this, that, if by choice somewhere you're doing something that's up to you, I don't want to get into those aspects of your life. But if it's compulsively happening in your life, it's time you do something. Things that we created should not rule our lives, isn't it? If you're doing everything by choice, consciously, it's up to you. If they are compelling you to do certain things, it's time you worked on it, it's time you did something about it. Please. Oh, it works only if you speak. Yeah, it's okay. Hello. But if… if you… if uh, sometimes we cannot waive stress and that's why we are consuming more caffeine, more sugar, whatever, it's chocolate or… or more carbohydrates. So if… There are any other equivalents that we can use under stress? I mean food equivalents. <laughs> so we are… we are addressing this as if a stress is a part of… as if stress is a part of your life. This happened to me a few years ago. When I first went to United States, 
Wherever I went, people were talking about stress management. I couldn't understand this. Why are people talking about stress management? My understanding, we manage things which are precious to us, our family, our wealth, our business and whatever else, whatever is precious to us. Why would anybody want to manage stress? It took me a while to understand these people have made a conclusion that stress is a part of their life. Stress is not a part of your life, you must understand this. You are stressful not because you have children, you are stressful not because you have a business to run, you are stressful not because life is not going the way you think it should be going, you are stressful simply because you do not know how to handle yourself. Your own body, your own mind, your own emotion and your own energies are in conflict with each other, they are in a state of friction. If this was well lubricated, there definitely would not be any stress. If this system was going very smoothly within yourself, there would not be any stress essentially means friction, isn't it? However wonderful a machine that you may be driving in terms of your car, if you drive it without the engine lubricants or engine oil, it won't last for ten minutes. The same thing goes for this. If the necessary lubrication is not created, if the necessary alignment is not happened within you, then everything seems stressful. Have you at least noticed this much? What one person thinks is very stressful, another person is dealing with it effortlessly. Yes or no? So it is not a situation which is stressful. It is your inability to manage yourself. When you are given such a sophisticated machine, what I am asking you is, did you ever read the user's manual? <laughs> no? Did you ever pay attention as to how this functions? Now we just did one simple experiment, this and this. Every day you are doing it, but you think you don't have to pay attention to this. Br there is a system, there is a whole science as to how to bring attention to every aspect of your life. The very way you sit, stand, breathe, eat, every aspect of your life, if you handle it consciously, you will see it will become something else. There is a whole science. As there is a science and technology to handle the external, there is a whole science and technology to handle the internal. You have to invest a certain amount of time in that. Um, we are at uh, the Which business… Speaking, please? We are here, I'm here. Oh. <laughs> um, we are at a business women uh, conference. Um, can you give me in three s practical steps how we can manage uh, to be vegetarian, uh, to do yoga, and uh, to manage uh, all the problems that we have around us in this world? in three steps. <laughs> One, two, three. Practical. Okay. Practical. <clears throat> if you… Uh, if you just had a hammer and an anvil, which is the most basic tool, one, two, three, I could teach you in three steps but you have a very complex, sophisticated machine which is capable of incredible things. When you have such a machine, I would say, let's pay a little more attention to it, if we want a good yield out of it. If it was a very simplistic thing, we could have done it in a very simplistic way. But anyway, right now we have only step for… Uh, time for three steps. One thing you could do is, we could have offered it to you right here, otherwise you… This is offered free to millions and millions of people across the world. It's a simple process of meditation which takes twelve minutes. You can go on the net and with a guided voice you can practice this. It is a technology for well-being. It is not a philosophy, it is not an ideology, it is not a religion, it is not a belief system, it's just a technology for inner well-being. Twelve minutes you invest on this. In your diet, Make forty percent of your diet into fruit and vegetable which is fresh and alive, live cells, not dead ones. Bring forty percent into your daily life, whichever way it's convenient for you. It is best if it's brought as one single meal as dinner or something, but if that's not possible, just add it somehow. 
whichever way. But if it comes as a separate meal, it's most effective. And uh, simple yoga cannot be thought like this because the simplest of yoga involves phenomenal amount of geometry. Today, yoga is being thought as a fitness mechanism, like they teach aerobics, they're teaching yoga. We would not want to teach something like that because something very profound, if it's taught in a very simplistic way, you will lose the possibility. Suppose I give you an airplane, you're given an airplane and you don't know what it is, I come and say you chop off these two wings which will anyway obstruct things and drive it like a car, you may like it but it's a disaster to drive an airplane with chopped off wings. So, the third step would be that uh, you invest two or three days to learn something very simple. Don't go for big things, something very, very simple. Two or three days you invest to learn something and bring it into your life, it will do a phenomenal change in your life, these three things, three steps. Um. Good morning. And anyway, to tell you, I'm not a business woman, but I'm running more than half a dozen businesses and uh, foundations and activity and movements and projects across the world. So I'm not somebody who sits in a cave and meditates all the time, okay? <laughs> uh, good morning. Thank you very much for your lovely speech. I'm not a business woman, I'm a legal expert for the National Human Rights Committee in Qatar. My name is Hala. Actually, is a very clever person who invited you to this uh, conference. I'm really uh, very enthusiastic to know your opinion about the concept of business and investment because most of business in this capitalism uh, world, it's about accumulating money and reinvested and accumulating money and again reinvested and have ambitions. You have said those women who have a very big plans, I can feel that it has been sarcastic with your compassion with the people who have running after big achievements and big plans. So does business uh, conflict with enlightenment? Not at all. I, I don't think… This is the question. I, at no point was I sarcastic. What I told her yesterday was, she said she has big dreams. Yes. If you have big dreams, the bigger they're better. And if they're very big, you must understand, you will never get to make it happen in a short span of lifespan that a human being has, if your dream is really big. If your dream is so big, if you take one step in that direction, it's a success. Other people may think otherwise, it doesn't matter, but because you have such a, such a large, big, huge dream in your mind, what you do may not manifest today, but you have taken the right step and set, the mo set into motion a possibility which will happen over a period of time. That was not said in sarcasm, that was said because she was feeling depressed, the things that she wants are not happening, I said, the bigger your dream is, the more it will not be fulfilled, but it's okay. But we have taken a few steps in the direction and that's what makes it happen. Now for us here, as a, a business conference here, what we need to understand is, there was a time a few hundred years ago when the religious leadership had the maximum influence on the societies in the world. In the last hundred… after that, military machines built themselves big and military leaders became the most influential leaders. In the last one hundred years, democratically elected leaders have become the most influencing factor on the planet. But in the next ten to twenty-five years, you will see that business leaders, economic leaders will be the biggest influence on the planet. But economic or business leaders have come with a tag around their neck, as you were mentioning, that they are vested interests, they are only interested in their profit. So it is a time, it is a time in history that business leaders have to move from a simple ambition of personal profit to a larger vision of well-being, because such a responsibility is coming their way if they don't want to fail in this responsibility. It's time that business leaders move from simple 
ambitions that one has to a larger vision of transformation and well-being. Thank you very much.